886. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a blessing to be here with each of you this afternoon. Uh, I'm appreciative of the opportunity that I've been given to speak here to you this afternoon. And I'm confident that as our study progresses this afternoon that we will uh, be able to take a new perspective and some application home with us about a topic that um, it applies to each and every one of us. Uh, but before we begin, uh, what I'd like for each of us to do is to uh, put ourselves in a hypothetical situation. Uh, that situation is that you happen to be walking down the beach where this bottle is stuck in the sand. And you, uh, this is kind of movie type stuff, but you come up on it and there's, there's a message in it and inside there's a map. And there's a message written on the map that says if you follow this map or X marks the spot, you'll find the most valuable treasure that you could ever ask for, that you could ever encounter the, the most valuable thing on this earth. The question is, would you follow the map? Right now, not knowing anything else but the fact that there's valuable treasure on the other end of the map, would you follow it? Well, I hope the answer is yes, uh, but if it isn't, by the end of this lesson, I'm, I'm confident that you will answer yes to this question. Because we have been given a map, or a list of instructions, if you will, by King Solomon in Proverbs chapter 2. Specifically, verses 1 through 9 is going to be our text for this afternoon. We're going to analyze it, we're going to break it down, and we're going to take what we can from it. Our topic this afternoon is wisdom from above, as you can see on the screen. We're going to read our passage here to uh, get it fresh on our minds. Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you, so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift your voice for understanding. If you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom, from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright, and he is a shield to those who walk uprightly. He guards the paths of justice and preserves the way of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice, equity, and every good path. <clears throat> this is our, our focus for the afternoon. We're going to be talking about uh, why Solomon wrote this passage, which is a question that we need to ask ourselves anytime that we dig into the, the Bible. Why was this written? Why is this here? Why am I learning it? And we're going to break down the three sections that he presents to us uh, in this passage. And we're going to see really what the message is here as he wrote this. Now, like I said, the first question that we need to ask is why. We're going to begin by covering the story about uh, when Solomon became the wisest man to walk the earth. And it's going to be very brief. It's, it's pretty much cause and effect here. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 5. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask, what shall I give you? You bump down to verse 9. Solomon, in a, in a very long and lengthy response, this is the main point that we can gather. Therefore, give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? And in verse 12, God responds, Behold, I have done according to your words. See, I have given you a wise and understanding heart, so that there has not been anyone like you before you, nor shall any like you arise after you. Paired with this, the, the giving of uh, the gift of wisdom from God to Solomon, and if you study through 1 Kings where the life of Solomon is chronicled, you see many examples of, the wis of this wisdom from God being used. Uh, a lot of the time for good, and near the end of Solomon's life he does uh, begin to make some questionable judgments, but for the most part we see good things happen. Um, probably one of the more famous judgments that he made uh, with this wisdom comes in the, at the end of the chapter in uh, 1 Kings chapter 3. It begins in verse 16 and it runs to the end of the chapter. Uh, for time's sake, I'm going to briefly summarize that story so I don't have to read the whole thing. But as the story is written, there are two women that become pregnant and they each have a child. And then one night, uh, one of the children uh, passes away. And the mother of the deceased child uh, 
secretly goes and switches the two children. And of course, when morning comes around, this sparks a dispute, an argument between the two women of who is the mother of the child that is still alive. Eventually, the judgment uh, is brought to King Solomon. And keep in mind that there are no DNA tests at this point, so it's going to take um, quite a uh, judgment of wisdom, if you will, to be able to find the truth. And in fact, he, <clears throat> he makes quite the judgment, and he says, to draw a sword, excuse me, <coughs> he says, to draw a sword and to cut the child in half, and to give half the child to each woman. One woman says, absolutely not, by no means do that, but to keep the child alive, and if, as long as the child can live, the other woman can keep it. And the other woman effectively says, yeah, sure, that's fine. If neither of us can have a child that is living, that's fine with me. And of course, King Solomon says, give the child to the first woman because that's the child's mother. An amazing judgment that brought glory to God. And we know that because the last verse in the chapter says that those who witnessed this judgment went away in awe because surely the wisdom of God had to be in King Solomon. Throughout, like I said, throughout 1 Kings, we see many other uh, uses of this wisdom. Uh, we see it in spiritual leadership and building relationships, maintaining his relationship with God, and like I said, bringing glory to God. <coughs> this all concludes to let us know that Solomon knew wisdom. He experienced this wisdom. He used it. Um, it wasn't uh, just something that uh, he just kind of had laying by. It was something that he used in his life, uh, in his reign, and that's really the question to why is this written? Uh, when we look at in the passage, he addresses his son and he wants his son to have a map or have instructions on how to also encounter this wisdom, how to go out and get it and how to utilize it. He, his desire was for someone else to experience that wisdom and that's us today as we uh, read this passage that he, that he wrote. Um, <clears throat> So like I said, we're going to break down this passage. The first section that he has is between verses 1 and 5. I'm going to read it one more time. He says, My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you, so that you incline your, heart to wit that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. <coughs> Excuse me. Yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, <coughs> if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. One thing to know about this passage is that he's talking about the pursuit of wisdom. And that anytime you pursue something, that's going to require intentional qualities, intentional actions upon the uh, individual who is doing the pursuing. One of those qualities is a desire to uh, hold the value of the treasure at the end of your, your map, if you will. We're going to look at a couple other passages that Solomon wrote about, uh, about acquiring wisdom. In Proverbs chapter 4, verses 5 through 9, he says, Get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her, and she will preserve you. Love her, and she will keep you. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And in all you're getting, get understanding. Exalt her, and she will promote you. She will bring you honor when you embrace her. She will place on your head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory she will deliver to you. I've underlined the key word here in this passage, and that's principle. He says, wisdom is the principal thing, therefore go get it. The word principle here can be interchanged with words such as superior or supreme. As to say, wisdom is the superior thing, therefore get wisdom. In another passage in Proverbs chapter 8, verses 12 through 14, it's an interesting passage in which Solomon writes from the perspective of wisdom as though wisdom is speaking to the individual that desires it. In verse 12, I, wisdom, dwell with prudence and find out knowledge and discretion. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance in the evil way and the perverse mouth I hate. Counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I am understanding. I have strength. In verse 17, I love those who love me and those who seek me diligently will find me. In verse 20, I traverse the way of righteousness in the midst of the paths of justice. This is an interesting passage because we get to hear directly from wisdom speaking to the person who is searching for it. 
And if you notice in the passage before, uh, wisdom, the word wisdom uh, has a feminine tense, so Solomon was writing she. This is as though wisdom is saying where she is, what she does, and what her value is. She's speaking directly to the person who is searching. <clears throat> what we can also draw from these last couple passages is the fact that pers- the pursuit of wisdom is a lifelong commitment. It's a journey that we walk on. It's not as though you can lay hold of wisdom and simply possess it as though it is an objective to complete. <clears throat> this is something, uh, you can look at it as though it was a courtship. It's though you're searching for her throughout your life and you are working diligently to build a foundation upon the wisdom can grow in your life. <clears throat> We're going to move to the New Testament and see what uh, James had to say to the New Testament Christians about this topic of wisdom. In James 1.5, we see, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. If you were to read the verse right before this, James writes about the Christian, uh, that they're talking about qualities that make the Christian perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And then directly says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. What we can draw from that is the fact that for a Christian to be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing, wisdom is necessary. This is a quality that all Christians should possess in their lives. When I was studying this, one thing that I found interesting was a passage in Luke chapter 21, about verse 15, where Jesus is talking to his disciples, and they are afraid because he's telling them about the end times, and he tells them not to be afraid and that he would give them a mouth and, and wisdom to speak so that their adversaries would not contradict them. What I find so interesting about the correlation between these passages is the fact that this is a persisting promise to us today as well. Jesus promised it to his disciples then, and we can see in this passage that, is, that wisdom is promised to us as well if we are willing to go out and get it. <clears throat> we have to pursue wisdom. The next section comes from verses 5 through 8. Solomon writes, Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom, and from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk uprightly. He guards the paths of justice and preserves the way of his saints. This is talking about understanding the source of wisdom. If you're going to pursue something, you need to know where it begins. And Solomon tells us here that it begins with God. So for the Lord gives wisdom, and from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. The phrase that stuck out to me most whenever I was studying this part of uh, Proverbs was in verse 5 when he says, Then you will understand the fear of the Lord. And I think as we dive into that phrase, we're going to find a key realization for us in our pursuit of wisdom. We look in Psalm 111.10, we read, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. In Proverbs 8.13, which we read a moment ago, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance and the evil way, and the perverse mouth I hate. See, here in these two places, the fear of the Lord are, are two different things. The fear of the Lord here is to hate evil, but the fear of the Lord previously was the beginning of wisdom. And to throw another wrench into the mix. Job 28, 28, Job's giving his discourse on wisdom and he quotes God. He says, and to man he said, behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. Something that's necessary to realize for us as Christians is the fact that wisdom is going to be built upon building blocks of knowledge and understanding. It's not enough to know something, but you have to understand it as well. What I mean by that, I'm going to try to uh, describe and give an example of from my own life. In school, we have a test every Monday. And on the weekends, is, that's my time to reinforce the ideas that I have learned throughout the week previously. Uh, it's, I'm doing my third, my fourth pass to the information. Uh, and, and I know facts that I've learned, but the way that I know that I can understand it is when I am able to apply them to my, to my tests, to my questions, whenever I can put them into practice. So if we back up to Psalm 111.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and a good understanding have all those who do his commandments. Knowledge comes from knowing the the will of the Lord, the commandments that he has charged us with, but an understanding comes from those who do his commandments. If the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, an understanding would be to put evil away from your life. Similarly, in Job 28.28, 
when, un, when uh, an understanding is to depart from evil. What we're trying to get at here is the fact that wisdom is going to be built on understanding the, the, uh, the will of the Lord. If we want to understand the source, we need to go to God. And to understand Him, we need to know His commandments. And the understanding comes when we begin to apply His commandments to our life, and therefore wisdom begins to grow on that foundation. <clears throat> Let's look again in the New Testament to see what James has to say. James three thirteen through 17. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. Excuse me. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Two things to learn from this passage. The first being in verse 13, when he's asking, how do you know who's wise? It's by their conduct. These are going to be the individuals that we respect and we revere in our respective congregations. Here I imagine it's the elders of this congregation that you respect, that you can see in their conduct that, the, that they have this wisdom from above. The second thing to learn from this passage is that there are at least two types of wisdom, letting us know that there are at least two sources of wisdom. The first type is the wisdom that does not descend from above. It's earthly, it's sensual, and demonic, and, ex and it exists where evil and corruption exist. The second, the second source is the wisdom that is from above. It comes from God. And you see that the qualities and the fruits and the characteristics of the wisdom that is from above are all good things. And all good things come from above. Keep that in mind as we read this next verse. Colossians chapter 2, verse 23. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom and self-imposed religion, false humility, and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. Paul is writing to the Christians in uh, Colossae, and he's basically he's correcting them because he says, you've died with Christ, but yet you're being distracted by the things of, that men are, are doing around you, that this is the showing of of earthly wisdom and it has the appearance of wisdom but in fact it has no value in your walk with Christ and that really he's telling them that they need to focus up the difference between the wisdom of the earth at least one major difference and the wisdom that is from above is that the wisdom from above does in fact have value in our in spiritual profit in our walk with Christ back in Job 28 I hope you can see that uh, in Job 28 well, he's given that discourse on wisdom, he says some really, really beautiful things about the concept of wisdom and what it means to have it. And he uses, in all of those little circles, there are different types of currency or different identifiers of wealth. And he compares wisdom and the value of wisdom to each of those things, and what it amasses to is the fact that the value of wisdom eclipses in totality the value of all of those things of the earth. Uh, each of those things are... are uh, Precious stones, jewelry, uh, gold, things of that nature that kings had that, that made them rich. It set them apart from everyone else. But in fact, the value of wisdom is much more important and it can set us apart as Christians. <clears throat> the last section that we see in Proverbs chapter 2 comes from verse 9. He says, Then you will understand righteousness and justice, equity, and every good path. This is the result of what comes before. If he's talking to his son here, he's saying, once you've accomplished these other things, once you've found wisdom, you have understood where it comes from, this is your result. Then you will be able to understand these things. For us as Christians, this is the time where we, we read this passage and we need to find the application in our lives. <clears throat> it's almost as though Solomon is trying to say wisdom will produce wise action. Let's look at a few verses that we can apply directly to our walk with Christ. In Colossians 1.28, we see him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. In Colossians 4, 5 through 6, a similar thought. Walk in wisdom towards those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. These passages in Colossians are talking about interacting with those that are outside the body of Christ, talking about wisdom being necessary to impart the word uh, to those who do not know it. 
In Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, we see, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom and admonishing, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. This time he's talking about our interactions with one another in the body of Christ. And all of a sudden, wisdom is a necessary quality in every interaction we have because all of our interactions fall in one of two categories. That's those that are outside the body of Christ and that's those that are inside. But yet a quality for both of those things is wisdom. We're already seeing how wisdom is necessary for the life of a Christian. In Acts chapter 6, verses 2 and 3, we see, Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. This comes at a time when the work of the church is being delayed, it's being set back. And the twelve realize that it's not, uh, a good, uh, it's not good for them to spend their time working on this specific uh, issue. So they decide to appoint some other individuals to have the responsibility and lead that work. And again, we see one of those qualities that is necessary for someone to fulfill that duty is wisdom. Uh, I don't think that it's any coincidence that if you were to go to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and look at the qualifications of overseers and deacons like we, like we saw David talk about this morning, that a lot of the qualities that we see there align directly with the qualities that we saw in James chapter 3 of the wisdom that is from above. That's why I mentioned that uh, the elders that, that we have here, that you would see those qualities, that in their conduct you're going to be able to witness that wisdom. <clears throat> In closing, I just want to summarize what we've covered uh, this afternoon, and that's that Solomon desired for anyone who read what he had to write, that they would be able to find their way to wisdom, that they would be able to experience it in the same way that he did. We noted just a while ago that as Christians, wisdom is necessary for us to carry out uh, all, of our, uh, all of the charges that we've been given as a member of the body of Christ. And yes, I mentioned specifically the roles and the offices of leadership, but if you'll note, each of us as a member of the body of Christ have a role to go and evangelize and to spread the, the word of Christ. In that role, which we covered in Colossians uh, earlier, wisdom is necessary there too. So let's not, uh, let's not think that we can put needing wisdom off to other individuals, but we also need it, uh, each and every one of us. When we began this afternoon, I asked you a question. I said, if you found a map and a bottle on the beach and it said that it would lead you to the most valuable treasure on the earth, would you follow it? And like I said, I think by the end of this lesson, your answer will be yes, because here's the map. This is the map we've been given, and today we only covered about nine verses that talked about how to find wisdom. It tells you exactly where to go, and it tells you how to get it. But there's a lot more in here. If you look in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 13 through 15, Paul writes, but evil men and impostors will go worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. We can look right here in the word and we can find the wisdom that we need. We saw that there is a persistent promise to us just as there were disciples when Jesus was t talking to them face to face. That's all I have for you this afternoon, but I hope that we have come to the conclusion that wisdom is necessary in each of our lives. And I pray that we've gained a perspective and an application uh, that uh, it's time for us to pursue that. At this time, we'd like to offer an invitation for anyone who might be uh, struggling, needing the prayers of the church, or would like to respond to the call of baptism. Whatever the case may be, won't you let it be known by coming forward as we stand and sing our song. <clears throat>